Hey, this is Steven from the Green Engineers, and uh, welcome back to my chore chat. Um, today's chores, I'm driving out to the coast, uh, Windsor, California, to uh, spend the weekend with my parents, my mom, my dad, and also um, my dad's sister and her husband um, out here for uh, some chill time, fly some quadcopters. Uh, maybe do some research on for more green engineer stuff on uh, some production machines. So I wanted to uh, continue to get ready to finish up talking about spending all the chore chats talking about the uh, machines. So I already kind of talked on my way up to San Francisco to a tech shop, which is another thing I'm going to do on the way home from San, on the way home from Windsor. I'm going to stop in San Francisco tech shop and cut out a prototype of the uh, the bamboo. Um, base 3D printer. So I wanted to finish up talking about some of the machines, talking about um, what each of the machines are. So far I've done the eco base. I've talked about it. I've talked about the shredder while I've been working on it. I did a chore chat while I was filing parts for the shredder, which the shredder is pretty much ready to be put together. Um, I made a miscalculation when uh, I had things water jetted. And they didn't fit together, so I had uh, my boss Don at the um, at the machine shop uh, redo a set for me. So now I have those. Um, actually, they're in the back of my car. I didn't take them out of the back of the car. So I'm, I guess I'm taking them with me to Windsor, not on purpose. But anyways, so today's subject we're going to be talking about the eco. Sorry, the um, fill factory. So the Phil Factory is a filament maker. Um, it is the second version of my version one of the multi extruder, which I'm also going to talk a little bit about briefly in this video, because you have to know about the multi extruder to know where the uh, eco, where the um, um, Phil Factory comes from. So the Phil Factory, and first I'll start out. The Phil Factory is basically a filament maker, and it is the second version of the filament makers I've designed. It would be the second filament maker I've designed. And it's for in-house production of 3D printer filament. So uh, in order to understand more about it, you need to know where I came from in the multi shooter So the multi shooter was the first version of the filament maker that I ever designed. And it was my very first product, and I went through a successful Kickstarter. And um, I'm still finishing up the Kickstarter even years later, which unfortunately is um, not really the best thing that could have happened. Um, but I, I'm still set on uh, fulfilling it, and uh, I'm pretty close to doing so. Anyways, uh, basically it was a DIY kind of prototype thing where um, it was made kind of like if you had to build a... You had to build a filament maker in a third world country and all you had access to was Home Depot and Radio Shack, what would you be able to build? And so this guy just uses a, um, just uses a slew of, uh, of galvi, galvanized uh, steel pipe for the body and then it uses a custom welded steel frame, which I'll get more into that, custom painted steel 3D printed uh, metal frame, metal stand. And then for a brain, it uses Arduino Mega, just regular run-of-the-mill Arduino Mega with an AVR. And then it uses a 2.3 inch touch, or 2.3 or 3.2, I can't remember. I think it's the two inch, uh, a two inch touchscreen, TFT full color touchscreen, resistive touchscreen. And it uses a heater band, 150 watt heater band, it uses SSR relay and uses a analog thermal, uh, thermal couple up amp. Now this guy was again basically my very first version. It was designed to be, if you were gonna build this thing, it was designed to all be open source and stuff and uh, my own firmware, designed my own firmware from scratch. But again, the idea was that it was supposed to be um, entirely able to be built with standard machines in a third world country, which it was built with a welder, a horizontal bandsaw, and a drill press. And uh, it's a MIG welder, but you could get it to work with a TIG welder. Um, so that was my very first version. I 
again, it was very crude. There was a lot of stuff on it that was really, really not built for production and stuff I didn't learn until later on um, about uh, how it is important for certain things in the production that I didn't have um, back then, those ideas. So uh, basically, um, starting off with that machine, all it did is it extruded onto the table. There was no feedback sensor, no winder, no nothing. Now for these, uh, for the Kickstarter, one of the things that I need to finish is I'm designing the dimensional control module, which will measure the filament, and then it will wind it, and then there's a winder that will wind it up onto a spool. What that allows you to do is that allows you, when you have a winder outside of the, um, the extruder motor itself, it has a lot of consistency to the diameter as it's outputted. And then when you have a dimensional control module, it adds feedback to that diamond, that uh, diameter. So as it comes out, it's able to read the diameter, tell the controller, and the controller could modify a setting in order to speed something up or slow something down, for example, to make the diameter bigger or smaller. Basically, it sends that signal back to the controller for the controller to be able to um, do the modifications necessary to the code and to the operation of the machine in order to uh, get that desired diameter output of the, um, of the machine itself. So the sensor that I'm going to use on that guy is the same sensor I'm going to use on the fill, uh, the, uh, fill factory. It's a um, Orns LMP linear motion potentiometer. And it's basically, it's got a slide potentiometer inside of a housing and then a shaft, a small 1.3 millimeter shaft uh, that moves back and forth, that moves the slider back and forth. Then the filament will, goes in between these two roller bearings and the roller bearings will push. One is stationary and one is floating and one's constrained to move back and forth on the Z. And that's the one that's attached to the sensor. So when that one's pushed aside or pushed back and forth, you have the measurement for your desired and so that guy is about a ten dollar sensor so it's really really nice when normally in the industry for uh, home grade ones you use uh, non-contact which is sometimes better but non-contact sensors uh, optical sensors that's able to read the filament but this guy is has a resolution down to uh, three tenths three 3.7 tenths of an inch, which is, uh, sorry, 3.7 thousandth of a millimeter, which is absolutely tiny. In inches, it's two tenths, 0. 0.0002 inches per, um, that's the resolution, and the repeatability is plus or minus a tenth. So it's super accurate, really, really linear sensor, really, really nicely built sensor for 10 bucks compared to when uh, some of the other some of the other systems out there they use the optical sensors and generally you can't get any sort of optical sensor under fifty dollars so this is a way better deal sorry about that it was my mom um, let me go ahead and put you guys on pause and I'm going to call back my mom all right I'm back sorry about that um, yeah, so basically those two modules are to increase the consistency of the filament coming out. As the filament comes out of the hot side of the extruder, um, it has a little zone where it can stretch. It goes through the dimensional control. The dimensional control measures it. Then it goes down and uh, down towards the floor, goes under a pulley, and so the pulley will redirect it to go up back towards the extruder itself but off to uh, off to the side and that's where you have your spool mounted on to your um, your spooler module and the spooler module will uh, help you wind up that filament onto a spool that you could then uh, use on your 3d printer so all together um, it's basically a whole package but uh, the original base module was just was just uh, the extruder itself with um, uh, with not even a hopper or anything like that. 
So um, this is it's a good machine, but there are definitely some things that I want to change, and uh, the, the things that I'm basically going to change is what's going to lead it to be the fill factory, which is the version two of the pole mixer. So. Uh, one of the things that needs to be changed is I want to simplify everything that does not have anything to do with the performance of the machine and uh, use that time and resources, money or whatever, on um, parts that are involved with the making of the filament. So for example, on the multi-extruder I had a auger on the inside which was a screw which would be permanent, which would be constantly turning to push the pellets down and out through the extruder itself. Now, on my, and this again was just a wood auger with a modified tip where the tip was cut off in order to uh, be able to become a, a constant screw. But normally in the industry on the screws, what you'll have is you'll have a, um, a metering zone, a melt zone, and then a compression zone. So the first zone is the melt zone, I mean the, the metering zone. That's where all the pellets come in to these grooves of the screw. And then the screw, the, so you have the flutes which is are on the outside. The flutes stay the same, are the same diameter because they're really, really close to the side wall of the cylinder. And then what happens is you have like the main shaft, the main stem of the extruder itself. And as, as the screw progresses down towards the end, what happens is that middle shaft gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And what this does is it presses the plastic. It compresses the plastic and presses it towards the outside, uh, towards the hot wall of the extruder. Because the extruder's hot, the extruder outside wall is hot on the uh, filament maker, and uh, that condense that uh, doesn't condense. What is it? Conducts. It has conduction with all of the plastic, and it heats up the auger and all that stuff. So what it does is it's compressing that, um, compressing those pellets to the outside wall and then those pellets are melting and then it continues to compress and compress and now you're building up pressure and then as you exit the screw you've changed the diameter, you've changed the volume of each of the flutes in between the flutes you change the volume considerably from the start to finish I think it was like two and three quarter um, increase, uh, decrease in volume so if you have two and three quarter if you think of it linear, uh, linearly, which obviously it's not, it's not an ideal material, but if you think of it ideally, when you increase the, um, when you increase the volume by that much, you increase the pressure also by that much. Um, so let's say three and three quarter uh, decrease in volume, so that means that you must have a three and three quarter increase in pressure, uh, three and three quarter times. So, whatever you're starting out pressure, you have a lot higher pressure at the end than you did when you started. And uh, so, that's a very important thing is to have a custom made screw that is custom, custom machined and um, designed specifically for this, uh, this application. The next one is the software that I use. That was another big problem with the multi shooter was that. I had the hardware and the software were really really difficult working with because the hardware I was using just uh, modules so modules that are attached to the Arduino Uno uh, the Arduino Mega and the modules had a big tendency of not being working correctly when you receive them and what would happen is it would give you all different types of signs of what is broken and why it's broken and how to fix it so it would pretend that the power supply is messed up or it will try to show you that the power supply, power supply is messed up or it'll try to show you that the um, let's say the heater like something else would show that the, the heater is messed up and you have to replace the heater and so, so it kind of just degenerated on the multi-shooter from um, you know trying to find patterns to 
just take it apart and swap out parts until it works correctly. That's ultimately what I ended up doing. So on the Phillip factory, it's going to use something very similar to the uh, Lyman extruder, the V5. Um, it's going to use something very, very similar to that. Um, it's going to use a 3D printer board. So the Lyman uses the um, ramps 1.4. I'll use something like that or maybe something slightly different. So I will use those part. I will use that and then they have um, a firmware called Mackerel which um, is kind of a parody off Marlin. So Marlin eats the Marlin fish eat the mackerel fish. So uh, Mackerel is a firmware for the lineman extruder to function as a film maker. And so it has a lot of stuff already built in. It's got a lot of support for uh, lookup tables for a thermal resistor. It has, um, it has the uh, PID loop for the right diameter. It has the board in there to power the uh, board and it's got its own graphics. But it's generally when you see it, it's powering a 2004 board, not a TFT touchscreen. So that's something else I'm going to change over to that so I can jump onto that project and um, help them out with uh, doing some development and also uh, it be a commercial product and show that it's uh, commercially viable. So that guy is a direct drop-in replacement for uh, pretty much any Arduino Uno board. And uh, it will definitely save me a lot of time um, finishing the firmware so I don't have to write everything all over again. If I, um, but I'm going to stay with the same controller and I can change the controller. Maybe to a Due or something, something with an ARM based, but it has to be able to run Mackerel. And another thing that Mackerel uh, requires is because it's a 3D printer board and has steppers for 3D printers. Um, you have these stepper drivers and then you need steppers for the uh, run. So basically everywhere I have a DC motor I'm going to replace with a stepper that can be adjusted for speed and thus tension depending on which one we're talking about. And also what time we're talking uh, at what time are we talking. So that is the um, that is kind of the things that are going to change. Another thing is the frame. The frame of the multi shooter was the biggest problem. Uh, it had a lot of things that you had to do on the frame. Um, you had to sandblast it, then primer it, then paint it, then top coat it, which was a major pain and required a lot of oven use. And it just kind of defeated the purpose of, um, of a production run of this of this machine itself. So, the next machine, instead of a fully welded using a jig um, steel frame, it's going to use aluminum extrusion, which is super, super popular right now in the maker space. Um, and what that allow me to do is just cut it wherever I'm cutting it on a horizontal bandsaw, cut it to size and then just throw it in the box and be done with it. Instead of spending three days to build a set of six, because it took me about three days to build a set of six um, for the for the multi extruder itself. It took me about six, seven days to build a frame for it. And so what that allowed me to do is save a lot of time and money there so I could spend it on the controls, which we went over to is um, Dribble 5. Uh, dribble, sorry, um, Lyman uh, extruder V6 or V5, and then also makes it uh, really compact. Sorry about that, took a little uh, break off of the um, recording here. Um, I had the uh, I think I had the AC down a little too low, so it was uh, making me fall asleep. So um, let's finish up the last uh, 10 minutes here strong. Um, so I'm about to go over the Golden Gate Bridge here, maybe 10 minutes. Um, yeah, so it's going to have new electronics. 
So how that's going to improve is again that uh, it just takes one, this one set of electronics and if something goes wrong, I just throw that set of electronics out and I put in a new set. And that set of electronics has capabilities of running touchscreens, um, regular 2004s, LCD screens, and all that kind of jazz. And then if you use the newer touchscreens, uh, if you use some of the touchscreens, they have Wi-Fi capabilities, like the um, M uh, MKS base, or you can even get the uh, ones where they're ARM-based, uh, but probably the macro will not work on ARM-based uh, systems that'll work on uh, AVR systems, which is uh, most of the Arduinos are AVR. Um, so, um, yeah, so those are uh, that's the reason why I'm going with electronics. Basically, what this guy is going to be is it's going to be a glorified 3D printer, it's going to use a lot of 3D printed parts, and because it's going to do that, it's going to keep the cost way down. And uh, there's actually going to be two versions I forgot to mention. One is going to be the maker version, which is the bare minimum that you need to for the fill factory to run and produce the same. Both of them will produce the same quality of filament, but the um, the actual commercial grade one, not commercial grade, but the actual home grade one, will have a lot different aesthetic. It'll have um, active carbon filters, HEPA filters. It'll have a whole housing around it. And also, it'll have uh, you know better looking hopper. It's just it's just got better better things. It just it produces both of them are gonna produce the same quality of filament, but the maker one's gonna look more janky and it's more um, bare minimum minimal esque, I guess you could say, version of it. And then you have the actual home grade one, which is you know for the house basically, while the maker one's for the tinkerer and somebody that wants to make their own filament on a budget and uh, that would be for that type of person. Now, the um, so the next thing is also, since I'm gonna be saving all the time machining that stand, um, I'm gonna spend that into all the other things that are required for the, um, for the fill factory to run and to run filament and perform perform well and also to extrude to make filament very quickly so uh, some examples like I said custom extrusion screw that's math driven that's math derived custom machined right on a lathe or um, a fourth axis mill um, then we have something like uh, then we have a machined extruder body where it's got a precision uh, precision cut center hole through the through the actual cylinder itself. It's a precision cut so that um, we have nice tight tolerances between the extrusion screw and the outside wall. Then again, with the electronics, we're going to have uh, stepper motors, geared stepper motors. So we have all of the uh, motor speed control and also the winder control and also the servo motor control for winding it onto the, the filament spool. Um, so yeah, the tube, the inside is going to be machined for the, um, for the auger itself, uh, the, the screw, the extrusion screw to get a nice uh, tight seat against the sidewall to not let any plastic get around it. Um, then, and those are probably going to be machined on the same exact machine itself, so the tolerances are going to be very similar because they're made on the same exact machine. Um, also, higher higher grade stuff like uh, the dimensional control module, I might even machine that out of aluminum instead of 3D print. Uh, 3D printing it takes about an hour and a half, an hour, 15 minutes, while you could machine them at about... Um, if you had a certain size, if you could find the exact size bar, you could uh, machine it very quickly. The problem is, is that it has, uh, is that it would take multiple rotations on it. So I think 3D printer is the best, and for that, uh, in production, I might buy the um, the printer belt from PrinterBot to uh, run that guy continuously to continuously print those instead of printing them how I have being printed right now, which is one at a time. So uh, those, that's uh, some of my ideas there. Um, 
what else. So again, the the full household version will have a um, HEPA filter and also an active carbon filter. So if you're if you're making ABS or ABS polycarbonate or um, PP polypropylene or HIPS or um, high density poly uh, polyethylene or low density polyethylene filament, you will uh, be protected. Um, from the smell while with the um, maker one that one's mainly designed to be making PLA uh, other than that you're going to get the smell and it's not going to protect you from the smell because there's no HEPA filter there um, what else so yeah it's going to have cooling fan dimensional control module and winder so it's going to wind it right up onto a spool for you and the household version will be all contained and it will have it will do the spool for you and it'll be nice and quiet and also have a nice interface which I've come up with my own custom interface which I'm going to implement the mackerel into and also I will be being part of that open source project where if, if I do develop anything and I do use the project I want to kick them back for for all of the investment they did in that project itself so anything else um, one thing that I would like to try which I've never seen done before in industry or in uh, the personal home market for any of the extruders is um, I wanted to add a system to mackerel where you could um, extrude custom colored 3D printer filament now in the industry in most um, when you're doing pretty much any extrusion whether it's filament or anything else, generally how you color the filament is you add what's called master batch, which is basically pellets of the same exact plastic makeup. So for example, if it's PLA, you're using something that has a lower melting temperature than PLA. So you're not gonna use ABS master batch with PLA because when you try to extrude it, that plastic's not gonna melt and your, and your extruder's gonna jam. So. Uh, basically you have these pellets with pigment inside of them and the pellets are made of similar uh, a similar material with the same uh, melting temperature or lower or the same exact material and then that pigment will just uh, will mix itself to fuse into that plastic and then you get your color and you get different hues of color and different shades by uh, messing with the mixture of one color to another so you can put multi multiple colors in there Etc. There's a video by um, Thomas. I forgot what his last name is. Thomas Strider. Starts with Ness. Anyways, uh, look up Thomas 3D printing, and you'll find his video. And then look up um, um, Proto Plant or Proto Pasta, and they will show you a video of um, where they're making their own color, and there they're working with Master Batch and also the Virgin Resin, which has never been formed before and you put those two together to make colors. However, the main problem is that they do mostly PLA, they do some polycarbonate, they do some ABS, I believe, still. Uh, they do some polycarbonate ABS mix, but their main go-to is PLA. Um, the problem is, is that when you change material, sometimes that new master batch is not compatible with a different material because of differing um, melting temperatures or it's a different plastic. And generally you don't want to mix plastics if they don't play nicely with each other. So what you have, what you can do, is you could have a, um, is you could use the actual pigment itself. But the problem is, is getting the pigment into the material because if you, you can't just, you know, you can't just dust some pigment inside of this chamber and expect it to get all the way down the bottom and mix. So you have to put, yeah, I would have to do some research in how you would disperse this pigment into the mixing chamber and it be able to get down the bottom and not get stuck up at the top. Now, the main idea with that is just like how you have with pigments in uh, printers, in regular 2D printers, is that you have a pigment suspended in a carrier, generally a liquid, and when you dispense that liquid onto paper, what happens is that liquid eventually evaporates and you're left with just solid pigment. So that's a similar idea that I'm coming up with, but the, 
problem is, is that you're pushing that that through a nozzle. So if you have, uh, you can't really use water because what will happen is if you're doing it in PLA, the water will get into the PLA and then the water will expand and pop the PLA out. So what you want to do is maybe use maybe like a vegetable oil or something and that will also allow it to lubricate the nozzle on the way out. So you're going to have less less friction against the nozzle and also it's not going to smell incredibly bad. Depending on what oil I use, I will have to do a lot of um, investigation on what happens when you cook this oil as it comes out of the, as, as it comes out of the nozzle and uh, which one smells the best and uh, which one helps um, the best with the performance. So what you would do for that guy is you would take your phone. There would be an app on your, a very simple app for your phone from starting out with. But there would be an app on your phone. You would take a picture of a color you want to color match. And then you would send that data to the printer. I mean to the filament maker. The filament maker will start to extrude the plastic. It will start to uh, mix. What it will do is it will have an RGB sensor on the uh, module on the machine itself it will have an RGB module on it the RGB module will read the color and it will start applying pigment and it will change it from RGB into CYMK it will convert it and uh, as it's doing that it will continue to monitor the color and also monitor how much pigments it's adding so that it will have a pid loop I guess you could call it where it would approach that color and then once it gets to that color, it will uh, stop adding pigment and uh, continue to add pigment to the specific mass that's coming out of this printer so that it can maintain that color. Now, in industry, generally how they do it is they do what you see in the uh, Thomas video that I told you uh, at Protopasta. They just, put in, they just put in a colorant and then they try it until they find the right solution. They don't run it through anything to check the color and to you know remember the color and to try to approach that color. Uh, they basically kind of do trial and error and then once they find out what color, if once they like that color, because generally they only, they only supply a certain number of colors. And once they find that out, they write down that color in some sort of you know book about all the colors. They write that down and then now they have the mixture permanently and they don't have to worry about it anymore. So let's say they start out, they do seven colors and then that's it. But what I would like to do is I would like to be able to, for somebody to take a picture of a color and then be able to produce pil uh, filament to match that color. So if you're doing you know, production and you want a specific color, you could do that. Or if you're doing, or if like let's say you're working for uh, 3D hubs, that will give you a big, um, big leg up on the competition to make even small batches of uh, of filament with this color um, for like a production run or whatever. So that's kind of the idea. Now, uh, one last thing I forgot to mention that would that would be machined on this guy is it'll also have a custom nozzle to get the best quality of. Um, extrusion and the best buildup of pressure and also easiest to take off of the machine and all that stuff. So it's going to have that guy on there as well. Um, so a custom nozzle with a filter on the, with a melt filter to make sure that anything that goes through there has to be melted otherwise it'll clog up the uh, extruder itself. So that's pretty much it for this guy. Um, the reason why I wanted to mention it, I have one other one other uh, chore chat that I have to upload that I took uh, last month or so, uh, maybe two weeks ago, two, three weeks ago. I, I did uh, two. I did one up to San Francisco for Tech Shop and then one back from San Francisco. Um, so I need to upload that first and then I'm going to upload this guy. And the reason why I'm pushing it forward is because I'm going to be... Um, I want to get a prototype put together before the end of the summer here, but I have to get out all the uh, multi-shooter ones. I have to get all the multi-shooter stuff out, and the modules are going to be pretty much the same except for different quality um, for the multi-shooter compared to the Filofactory. So I need to get those guys done, and so 
uh, that being said, I shortened my vacation here for this week. I was supposed to be going to Oregon for this week, but I just went this weekend, and I'm going to get cracking on uh, getting the multi-shooter done and shipped so I can focus on the fill factory and my shredder um, and also the EcoBase 3D printer. I'm going to get cut on my way home. So that's basically all that I have to talk about, about the fill factory. Um, I hope to do a build blog of it soon, um, and also whenever I have any sort of updates on it, and uh, I'll give you guys some sneak peeks. Obviously, there's going to be a Kickstarter for it, so Kickstarter for the Maker version, as well as the uh, regular version all in, one, uh, all in one Kickstarter, Kickstarter and Indiegogo. But I'll definitely be letting you guys know of that before that happens. So that's uh, pretty much it. Um, if there is any uh, development in it, like I said, I will be posting that to my YouTube channel on this chore chat. Um, I'll be talking about it. And uh, yeah, so this has been Steven from the Green Engineers. I like thank you guys for listening along with my chore chat. And I hope to do one on the way home, maybe about a update after I get back from, uh, after I get out of Tech Shop San Francisco, uh, machining this, uh, this um, laser cutting out the prototype for the EcoBase 3D printer. And uh, hopefully I could get, uh, get an update in on that and uh, some of my uh, plans here because I am going to have some influx of funds because I am getting a new job that starts on the 9th. My first job in the engineering industry, and I'm going to be making quite a bit more money than I did at the machine shop. And so I'm going to start investing in machines, possibly. And also, Tech Shop San Jose is supposed to be opening here within this next week. And so we'll see if that actually happens. Again, this is the... says here that today is um, 6-29, June 29th. So uh, we'll see if that actually happens. But, uh, yeah, so that's pretty much it for this video. This has been Stephen from the Green Engineers, and I like, thank you guys for listening along in this short chat. I will talk to you guys probably on the way home. I hope to get this up uh, from the hotel room uh, in Windsor. And, um, yeah, so I hope you guys enjoyed uh, listening along, and I'll talk to you guys in the next one. Thanks for listening. Take it easy.